Hello, Paris. Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a great time. Are you having a great time? That's good to know, because I am having a terrible time. I caught this flu this week, and I thought, how I will stand to this stage 15 minutes talking to 180 meters all. And tonight, I could not sleep with fever, and I had this kind of hallucination dreams and so on, you know. And I got an idea there. And I, I, I will need your help. So I ask you that you, if you have things uh, on your lap and so on, put them on a safe place under your chairs. And um, first I want to talk why I, I, I need this. I, I grew up in a kind of ugly suburb of a very beautiful capital city at the Atlantic. And my first contact to nature and uh, my uh, interaction with nature was when going to, to the coast to surf. And you have these moments when you are surfing and you can be completely wasted either because you partied the last days or because you were uh, surfing the whole day. But when there's this wave coming, you get this adrenaline and this energy because you want to catch this wave and you definitely don't want to be caught by the wave. So what I'm going to ask you is that we make a big wave and show the power of the KubeCon in Paris. And for this, I, we, I will give you a signal on three. And the, of course, the first lines go and you know our wave works, no? So let's go. One, two, three. Ah. This was not a wave I would like to catch. Come on, I want, I, I want energy. I need your energy and your impulse. And I also want to hear the, the, the overflow rooms and the people at home. So everyone needs to make. So again, one, two, three, go. Up to the back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is the start of the story. <laughs> The story I'm going to tell you is precisely about the urgency of climate change. Already in the 90s, when I was surfing, we had already all these environmental issues coming up. And, um, but the politics were still not so, so far with it. We had the first meetings in, in uh, the Rio de Janeiro in 92. We had the first Kyoto Protocol with the first commitments to climate targets. <clears throat> but they were all kind of insufficient although science already knew that it's an urgent matter and requires multi-level action and engaging every individual and organization to achieve the targets that we need. And um, it was not difficult when a friend of mine um, contacted me uh, one day and, and said, hey, we have this team at the Deutsche Bahn and we do Kubernetes and so on. And yeah, I love I loved this, and, uh, but I also said, yeah, this is actually a... Um, company with a purpose because it's, I love trains, I love train travel, and um, I like to, um, <clears throat> I think sustainable mobility is, um, with trains is uh, very important to achieve the climate targets, and our company also believes this. So we are pushing forward to more train transport for freight and passengers. And for achieving this, we obviously cannot just build infinitely more infrastructure, this is quite heavy infrastructure, we also need to optimize the infrastructure, make it more efficient, more modern, and this requires a high degree of digitalization. But digitalization comes with an, with an impact. And the impact is, according to the International Energy Agency, quite uh, remarkable. We see that in the next three years, according to the last report, we will at least require the amount of electricity consumption of Sweden and in the worst case scenario, the electricity consumption of Germany. So we are reaching an exponential consumption phase. And of course, there are um, approaches to reduce it, but <clears throat> we also want to uh, approach that the Deutsche Bahn started a green digitalization initiative in 2022 to address this question. And <clears throat> it came with the support of CEOs and CIOs, but it, immediately raised also a very strong grassroots movement from developers, from employers of the company that started raising a lot of initiatives to um, small initiatives on their free times, uh, making small contributions 
uh, to measure, for example, um, the, the emissions of websites or uh, to make some papers on how to uh, reduce the impact on your home office work, all kinds of initiatives raising there. And we also had a project where we wanted to measure and to bring developers to be able to measure the impact of our workloads. And we started because we are a cloud based, uh, we have a cloud based approach. Uh, we started to look at what the cloud providers uh, give us in terms of tools. And unfortunately, we did not find uh, very um, helpful information because the tools um, have limitations. They are not able to assign to an application. So if I have uh, on my account multiple applications, uh, there's no tech support. Uh, I cannot distinguish it. Uh, the granularity is very low, so I have 50% EC2 and 20% um, everything else. It's not telling me much. It's not very actual. Sometimes we get the information three months after uh, the data has been uh, created. And it does not give you any information on the energy use. Why is this important? Because emissions there are calculated also with compensation. And this means that you are not able to establish a casual, casual relationship between the actions that you do on your all day and um, the, the effect on emissions. And to understand also the problem of compensation, uh, I would like to ask who is here a fan of Doctor Who series? Yeah, quite some, yeah. Great science fiction series. I watch it with my daughters every uh, evening almost. And I, we hope still to finish it before they leave home. But um, yeah, there's this episode where uh, they say suddenly wake up in the middle of London and London is full of a forest. So this is for me a good metaphor of compensation. Of course, compensating carbon is an important measure. But we cannot think that with an exponential growth scenario of exponential growth of energy demands that we will be able to compensate all this energy because there are effectively limits to growth, physical limits. And, and so we need to address the different strategies for um, sufficiency, what I really need and why, for efficiency, how do I minimize the resource use at production and, and production, and consistency, which would be the case, for example, of, of compensation. So focusing, first of all, on the efficient part and on the role of developers. Back to the agents on this talk, I had the to topic developer empowerment. So developers are effectively, effectively the everyday decision makers in what comes to software. We don't need management papers to, um, to say we, we are doing this and uh, achieving these targets. If we don't engage developers and give them the tools in the hand, we will not be able to make a change in the way we develop code, in the way we um, manage infrastructure. So we pose the question, what tools and, the, and approaches are able to empower these developers? Let's start with platforms. We have a platform strategy at the Deutsche Bahn, and in the last years, we converge uh, the whole subsidiaries to um, enforce standardization in this, in this um, level. And the importance of platforms is, uh, on this aspect is that we can leverage effects and provide a high level of standardization and open to contributions that improve it continuously and provide safe, sane design um, aspects that everyone can use without even thinking, am I doing it green or not? It's just um, helping you to be green per default. I myself, I'm a bit biased. I love Kubernetes. I was product owner of two teams uh, in this field and uh, have a personal affinity to it. But I believe Kubernetes is a tool for efficient cloud operations and for carbon footprint reduction per excellence. It's not only a container orchestration tool, it's much more powerful than that. It's a platform building tool and it's a green IT tool. We have, uh, with our uh, clusters, achieved one of the um, interesting, uh, very high density of containers. We have some shared clusters and we had uh, uh, then put, of course, the node auto scaling and we managed to achieve around 70% of CPU utilization on these shared clusters. It's quite a high utilization, so you would say, well, we are effective, we don't need to do anything else. The fact is, however, only 15% of this utilization was effectively used by the applications. 
We could see for this, for example, on Grafana dashboards, where there are a lot of reserved um, CPU utilization, but only a very small part of it is being used. Why is this happening? Well, once it runs, no one cares. We, are, we have a lot of things to do in our business all day. So I defined requests and limits. Um, traditionally, um, the API uh, um, requests limits 512 megabytes. It is running. I make it conservative because I think maybe there will be a lot of people coming and then I cannot burst, so uh, rather have it conservative. And it stays there. And it's taking CPU, it's occupying the node and wasting resources. Fortunately, Kubernetes offers us a vertical pod autoscaler. There are also, of course, horizontal pod autoscaler and so on. But I find this one particularly interesting because it is taking out of the ends of the developer the need to think what would be the appropriate resources and rather making recommendations or even automatically adjusting the container workloads to be optimized to their needs. So let's go out with expensive get work and make sure to use vertical pod autoscaler. The second aspect related to the sufficiency is scheduling. And Kubernetes is also good on this. You know, we have all these worker rights movements that manage that we are able to work eight hours a day and have eight hours to do whatever we want and eight hours to sleep. I don't think most of you do this anyway, but, but let's assume everyone works from nine to five, like, like, like would be the traditional approach. This means two thirds of the day, there's no one at the office and your workloads are running there. Development environments, test environments, we're testing it. We're test testing stuff at midnight. Just turn it off. Use cube downscaler, annotate your deployments, so, so simple like that. It will turn off when you leave the office. It will turn on again when you, when you come back and it's working. You don't even need to care for it. It does it every day. It saves a lot of energy and it costs nothing. Last aspect. We need information, visibility. It's like if I am traveling by train and my train is late or it fails, what do I do if I did not have good data informing me, providing me how, how will be my alternatives. So this is where we came with Kepler. We wanted to grab the energy metrics. And I will not go into detail in Kepler here because there are 50, at least 50 people in this room for sure that know in detail how Kepler um, evaluates uh, energy statistics and transforms this into, uh, into watts. Uh, but the interesting there is that you can actually get information from high level up to the container level. So really have an information on, real, on near real time on how much energy your single components are using. And you know in Grafana, it's also possible you can make, for example, an annotation from your pipeline and associate a certain change in your code with an impact on the consumption. We tried to roll it out, we thought it's actually, yeah, great, open source, it's available, let's just roll it out. It was not so easy. The first one was the enterprise readiness in terms of security. There were some unneeded dependencies um, there that we needed to remove. We were able to give, give a contribution, which was great. And the second one was, well, there were a lot of metrics. So there was someone being called in the night on the on-call duty, and you know how people hate this. No one likes to be called in the night for because the monitoring system is overloaded. So we had to reduce the um, scraping interval, which was def by default on three seconds, to much less. And actually, we don't want to keep also so much data. So it's, it's enough if we have 10, 20 seconds scraping to give this information about uh, what is the effect of the different commits. So data is the source of everything. And we have seen on the left side, where you see the green, is the Kubernetes pushing back to Grafana, and it allowed us to make these beautiful dashboards. Dashboards are always something beautiful. I, I find them at, at least, and I think many people love dashboards. And um, <clears throat> with this, we had the first tool that really brings this in the hand of developers to, to make a change. And then we, of course, 
started getting more and more people interested on this and to gather the whole uh, cloud carbon footprint um, data. And we required a middle layer with our data lake, with a data, with a data set, with data governance that is in the middle and allows for other systems to couple and also create information for other potential agents. Like, for example, architecture management. And enterprise architecture management, we see here um, an example of the dashboards that we are building with our enterprise architecture man management system. And um, so um, it's about really bringing the tools also to, and, and the information to the tools that are already being used by these people. So as a final remarks, I would like to say the first important thing is start. Start now. It is urgent. The issue is urgent. And we are all in an early stage of knowing how to actually measure energy. We have lack of information. We don't know if this data is good, but it's better as no data. Some information is better as no information. So just start. You will see how many people, because really developers have an intrinsic motivation not really to save costs, but everyone has an intrinsic motivation to care for our planet, I believe it. So just start small and beautiful, and you will see how your community and your system around the platforms and around Green IT will um, grow. And focus on empowerment, focus on, on the agents, on the people that are on the all day taking decisions with their actions. Encourage developer in initiative and their intrinsic motivation. So thank you very much. Um, let's stick together. If you want, contact me or any of my colleagues that are also on this uh, conference. And um, it was a pleasure to be here. And I would like to, to ask the moderator to come here and re because I want you also to experience this wave. Yeah. So let's do it one more time, if you don't mind. Huh? So one, two, three. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you so much, Walter.